Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Rack and Turn. I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to share some thoughts on Great Jones Street by Don DeLillo. This is DeLillo's third novel, published in 1973, but it's really the first of his novels where he begins to dig in, to explore the themes, the ideas that are going to absolutely consume the rest of his career. Uh, it's a book that's focused on celebrity, the collision of public celebrity versus the private life of a single individual. Uh, it's a book that's also focused on memorabilia and physical media, and, and DeLillo has this interesting idea around how there can be objects you know, that are curiosities to a certain extent. They don't really have intrinsic value. They don't, uh, they're not necessary for survival. They're not necessary for life or, or for a happy life. But because some small group of people or one individual who's particularly wealthy or powerful imputes value to the object, it becomes desirable. It becomes something to possess, to consume. And that makes it something that can be the object of a quest. <laughs> but it also makes it something that can become dangerous to possess, dangerous to seek after. Uh, and that serves as this critique, this interrogation of what it means to be a consumer, what it means to be a member of a society that's so fixated on consumption. Uh, and so th those ideas are very present in Great Jones Street, um, and, and DeLillo crafts them in interesting ways. Uh, and so in, in some ways it, it does serve as a roadmap, a primer for what uh, he'll be doing across the rest of his career. It's probably not the best place to start with DeLillo, all that's a whole other separate video, <laughs> maybe for this fall. Uh, but it is an interesting work to read. Um, as his third novel, it has some weaknesses. The DeLillo dialogue is not at its best here, but it has some wonderful, absolutely wonderful sentences. Sentences like, Beauty is dangerous in narrow times, a knife in the slender neck of the rational man, and only those who live between the layers of these strange days can know its name and shape. Great sentence. DeLillo can craft sentences like that. Um, and that is perhaps... Uh, one of, the, one of the other great reasons to read this book is we start to really get a glimpse of who the, uh, the dangerous Don DeLillo will become. Uh, because in some respects, this is an example of the road not taken in his career. Uh, this book and his subsequent book, Ratner's Star, are, I think, written under the heavy, the heady influence of Thomas Pynchon, particularly The Crying of Lot 49. And, um, and so th there, there's a road not taken here. They, they're whimsical. Uh, they have that, that sense of playfulness that exists in Thomas Pynchon novels, uh, the, the sort of postmodern and, and formal postmodernism where there are song lyrics included, all sorts of metafictional techniques going on. That, that's occurring across Great Jones Street. Um, but it's not something DeLillo would really spend a huge amount of time doing across the rest of his career. He would do it, but he would do it in his own way, and it wouldn't necessarily be fun and silly. Uh, with DeLillo, his, his, his books at their best can feel dangerous. There's no stone left unturned, and, and there's this sense that at any moment um, in his novels, something dangerous can happen, something, something can shift, can turn over. Uh, and it could be on the third page, it could be on the 300th page. And that's what can make him a very effective writer. And I think he, he's doing that to a certain degree of success here in Great Jones Street um, when he's not getting in his own way as a, as a young developing writer. Uh, so what's going on in Great Jones Street? Well, we have a rock and roll musician, Bucky Wonderlick, aka Bob Dylan, who has retired from the public scene, has stepped away. He just sort of has disappeared. Nobody knows where he's at. There's uh, he and he's a, it's a first person narrative uh, from Bucky Wonderlick's point of view. And we see he has retreated to this dingy little squalid apartment on Great Jones Street in Manhattan. Uh, the, the other folks who live on the first floor and then, uh, you know, above him on the third floor, they, you know, lead lives that, that feel very desperate. Um, and he's sort of just pulled back. Uh, his, his manager, the, the people who run Trans Paranoia, <laughs> that's a little line if there ever was one. Um, they, they know where he's at. Different people are, are going to interact with him, he, you know, but the public at, at large does not know what has happened to him. And that um, is a critical aspect to the novel. There are people who think that Bucky is amazing for accomplishing this. Happy Valley thinks privacy is the essential freedom this nation, country or republic, offered in the beginning. They think you exemplify some old idea of men alone with the land. You stepped out of your legend to pursue personal freedom. There is no freedom, according to them, without privacy. The return of the private man, according to them, is the only only way to destroy the notion of mass man. Mass man ruined our freedoms for us. Turning inward will get them back. Revolutionary solitude. Turn inward one and all. Isolate yourself mentally, spiritually, and physically on and on. World without end. <laughs> um, that, that comes from a, from a character who is ultimately revealed to uh, not necessarily have the context to, to make that statement or that Happy Valley is, you know, uh, a sort of dangerous underground domestic terrorist organization. 
does not necessarily reinforce this idea around um, privacy and its value, but Delulo is making a choice there, and it, it, it's a satire around um, what would exist in society, that he has individuals who seem to not possess the authority to make that statement, give a statement that is, within it there resides a kernel of truth that he wants to get at, this idea that um, celebrity at, uh, sort of by definition becomes an invasion of privacy. Um, and that's that's an interesting idea. Um, we have, you know, if you're if you're a big listener of Bob Dylan, you're gonna love this book uh, because there's all sorts of references to what's going on. The infamous, infamously terrible album Self Portrait uh, is satired as PP Mama, and we get lyrics from various songs on these Bucky Wonderlick albums. They're not particularly strong. Uh, we have a, a character who is. The, the lead guitarist for Bucky's band who's going to branch out on his own and he seems just wildly self-aggrandizing uh, an, an indictment of who Bucky could have become who this celebrity could have become had he chosen to continue pursuing that path and so that's all going on but uh, at its heart is this this quest Bucky's quest for privacy uh, and his his privacy is ultimately revealed uh, to a, sort of be symbolized by what are called the mountain tapes. And these are very obviously the underground basement tapes that in 1973 had not been released. They were two years away from being released. And so Bucky has these tapes he recorded on his own that nobody else, you know, is supposed to be able to hear or listen to. He himself doesn't really go listen to them. Uh, and so they exist in this ether, this this cultural ether, and they're critical. They, they, to him, represent his truest self. And that's what they ultimately come to symbolize for everyone else as well. Uh, and so there are individuals who are, who are trying to, when are you going to release those? Or do you want to just release those instead of recording another album? And um, that, that becomes interesting because there's, everybody wants to consume the mountain tapes and Bucky has to decide, you know, is he willing to reveal that side? If, if he reveals that side of himself to the world, he has almost nothing of himself left. And, and that um, tension is interesting. It's effective. Um, the, the way in which then, you know, things like drugs are being traded and there's a wonder drug, that, that, those are the parts that feel like closer to Thomas Pynchon, along with all the song lyrics that are in there. Uh, but, but ultimately, it, it does work on a number of levels. There, there are some ways in which Great Jones Street is very clearly not an incredible book. It, I would not make it your first Don DeLillo novel. But coming to it, having read most of his other works, it becomes interesting to see like this is sort of where the seeds are planted for what will become Mao Tu with its focus on celebrity and privacy uh, and terrorism. What will become Running Dog uh, later on in the 1970s, one of my favorite DeLillo books um, and, and a book that I think takes the dangerous side of Great Jones Street and then makes that its main thrust. Uh, what will become um, Underworld and the many weird paths that that book wants to travel uh, while having this focus around a baseball and the video of this anonymous murderer um, and the way that those sort of collide across Underworld and many different paths. So it becomes an interesting book. Uh, and it has sort of a final statement around celebrity. Bucky, you have no power. You have the illusion of power. I know this firsthand. I learned this less in lesson after lesson and city after city. Nothing truly moves to your sound. Nothing is shaken or bent. You're a bloody artist you are. Less than four ounces on the meat scale. You're soft, not hard. You're above ground, not under. The true underground is the place where power flows. That's the best kept secret of our time. You're not the underground. Your people aren't underground people. The presidents and prime ministers are the ones who make the underground deals and speak the true underground idiom. The corporations, the military, the banks. This is the underground network. This is where it happens. Power flows under the surface, far beneath the level you and I live on. This is where the laws are broken, way down under, far beneath the speed freaks and cutters of smack. You're not insulated or unaccountable the way a corporate force is. Your audience is not the relevant audience. It doesn't make anything. It doesn't sell to others. Your life consumes itself. Um, and that will... will become, you know, that, that that paragraph in and of itself becomes the nexus of the entire book Libra. Uh, and, and in some ways, aspects of Underworld as well, that um, what we think of as this cultural underground, these people who have, have stepped away from the consumer society and found sort of their own path, and that they think that there's this superiority or, or some uh, purpose to their existence apart from that, don't understand that they're still part of this 
despite being underground, there's a layer beneath them where the actual power is moving, where even they, trying to separate themselves from society, remain controlled and, and you know, enmeshed in that fabric of society. And it's it's part of why Delilah can be a very great writer. Um, so let me know if you've read this one. Let me know what your favorite song from the Basement Tapes, your favorite Bob Dylan album is. I'd be happy to <laughs> share mine. Uh, and we'll see. We'll see if I'll be returning to this writer soon. I don't know. I'll have to check in with the underground. Thanks.